Thank you all for being here um, at Notorious Local History with special guest Notorious Bakersfield podcaster <laughs> and now local author Robert Peterson. My name is Lynn Kemmer and I'm a librarian overseeing the Kern County Library's local history collection and archives. And our collection here includes books, newspapers, newspapers, city directories, photographs, yearbooks, and more. Photographs are also scanned and freely available online along with our newspaper archive, newspaper database, and other primary source and historical research databases freely available online. You can access those resources um, here at the library. Um, and also from the comfort of your home, but it will require that you log in using your library card number. And we do recommend that you set up an account so that you can store materials and items that you find when you're conducting your research and then can go back and reference them. We're also the archive of the Bakersfield Californian and have a collection of newspapers on microfilm along with other titles. You can find the title list by the microfilm in the back of the room, so you can see the full list of titles that we have available on microfilm. We're getting two new microfilm machines in, which we'll also be able to digitize. And we hope someday in the near future that uh, people will be able to access the information online and search and retrieve information. Um, as many of you know, the local history room closed in October 2022. Uh, for work on the fire suppression system. And prior to that, we were open 1 to 5 p.m. And even before that, pre-COVID, by appointment only. So it's with great pleasure that I can announce that the local history room will be open the same hours as the library from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 6 Friday, and 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday. We're very excited to announce the reopening at this event and that Robert was available to come and talk about how he's utilized our local history room over the years to craft his true crime stories and ensure their accuracy, as well as share some of the cases he has chosen to highlight. So without further ado, please welcome Robert Peterson. You get the catalog? You get the catalog? <laughs> Thank you for coming out. Uh, welcome. Uh, I, it's gonna be really cool because standing here I can see where two of my stories took place. And uh, so that's kind of cool, and I'm gonna tell you about them, including another story. Um, but we're kind of, should I tell the stories first or in with the stories, Lynn? Whatever you Talk best. about the, do you have the catalog? I'm getting it for you oh, now. okay. So obviously <laughs> then maybe start with the other things since we don't have the catalog I'll, right I'll start with the stories. Um, my keys are in that drawer right there. Uh, with the, uh, the first one right is uh, a deputy kills Thank Bakersfield so police much. officer. Um, there was a Bakersfield police officer, he was a motorcycle officer, and his name was Lacey High. He and his uh, wife were estranged. He was dating a woman, and after he got off work one night at midnight, they went over to, does anybody know the, what the, uh, the drive-in was over on Q Street here? Was it Mitch, Mitchner's? Went over there and um, with his girlfriend, they went to a party. Um, Lacey got pretty drunk and um, they stopped at a gas station on Union and they were coming down Union, stopped behind Little Sweden which is that crab in a bag, and they're back there, and his, his girlfriend got out of the car, and uh, he was trying to get her back in the car, and she said no, and so he pulled out his revolver, and he just started shooting, uh, walking down the street. Um, he would just walked down 17th Street. Is that 17th Street? Yeah. 17th Street. Back here, um, Bakersfield police officers were called, and they recognized him as one of their own. And so they weren't too afraid of him, and they just kind of basically said, you know, Lacey, you know, stop it, knock it off, and he kept shooting his gun and kept walking down 17th Street. Well, it went out over the, the uh, police radio, the frequencies, um, the sheriff's department picked up the call, 
And if you know anything about old Bakersfield, the, the Kern County Jail used to be here, the downtown jail used to be here where the federal building was. And some of the deputies inside the federal building um, heard the call and they said, well, let's go check it out. They're walking down towards this. And remember, the Bakersfield Police Department knew who the guy was, knew who Lacey was. The deputies, they didn't know. And so they came out of the, came out of the, uh, the jail. They walked up the ramp and lay, they had uh, uh, their shotguns at the ready because this guy's walking down armed. And Joe, does anybody remember Joe uh, Gallon? Gallon? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gallion. Gallion. And Lacey turned his gun on one of the deputies, Joe Gallion, um, saw that and he fired and he killed Lacey High um, right there behind the federal building. So that's kind of an interesting story. It's pretty. Oh, goodness. It's in my book. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I think 50s. Oh, yeah. Is Joe Gallion also the guy that arrested Merle? Joe Gallion arrested Merle Haggard. That's his claim to fame. Uh, I'm friends with Ann Gallion, and <laughs> I went over to her house and saw the saw the ticket. And, uh, but yeah, he's kind of a, made a name for himself. Um, I think Gallion, his dad used to be the coroner of Kern County. So. Um, and my aunt knew who that was. So, um, the other story that's in my book uh, happens right right where um, the Marriott is. P Street used to run through, and it would be on the end of the Mar of the Marriott on the up opposite side. But what happened there? Well, I kind of have to give a backstory. <laughs> uh, uh, Wiley Doris was a, um, a prominent Bakersfield attorney. He, uh, when he first came to Bakersfield, he opened his law office at, and he considered running for, for assembly. And then World War I broke out and he decided to join the Navy instead. Well, his wife, Grace Doris, said, well, I'll run in your place. And she ran for the California Assembly representing Bakersfield. This was 1918, and the 1918 election, two years before women had the right to vote. Women didn't get the right to vote in the United States as a whole until 1920, and Grace won. And she was one of four women that were elected to the California Assembly. Um, and there's, not, there's hardly any, rec there's no recognition of, of Grace Doris in Bakersfield. There's no parks named after, no, no streets named after, no schools named after. And it's kind of frustrating that she achieved so much in Bakersfield and there's no recognition of her. But her husband, uh, Wiley, he was kind of a character in, in the courtroom. His uh, stock rose when, in the 1940s when he represented uh, police chief Grayson in his scandal corruption scandal, and uh, people thought, well, if this lawyer is good enough for the police chief and got him off with a slap on the wrist, he's good enough for me. So he, 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 he uh, represented some of the high-profile defendants in, uh, in Bakersfield. Um, he was kind of a character in the courtroom. He was very um, uh, theatrical, and judges used to admonish the spectator, because it was a big deal to go to the courtroom and watch Wiley argue a case. And um, he actually, you know, he would, would cry real tears when he was arguing for his, trying to get sympathy from the jury about his client. And he'd pull out his handkerchief and wipe his tears away. And people, the spectators loved it. This is before, you know, daytime soaps. So that was their entertainment. Um, in the, 19, in uh, the 1950s, they wanted to build the, uh, um, the, the underpass on Chester Avenue. And there was a big um, opposition to it. Anytime that there's a road improvement project, there's people that's going to be opposed to it. We see it now. We saw it with 24th Street when they wanted to widen it. It was happening back in the 50s too. But uh, a lot of the downtown businesses, merchants, they didn't want to do it. Uh, Haberfeld had his dealership there. It was going to impact his business. So there's a, you know, 
there was there were a lot of people that didn't want it. And Wiley was kind of the spokesperson for that opposition. And they wanted to build the, the underpass here on Q Street or on P Street. Those, those were the two alternative uh, places they wanted them. They lost. <laughs> they went ahead and built or made the underpass there on Chester Avenue. Um, it didn't matter if Wiley Doris was their opposition spokesperson or not. They, they got their way. The city got their way. And uh, one day, Wiley was leaving the courthouse, and he was pulling out of the parking lot on Q Street, was going to cross the railroad tracks, and he was hit by a freight train, and he was killed instantly. I think that's kind of a fascinating story. The irony of all that is just amazing. Yeah, I just how he how he op opposed that. It's kind of like him saying, you know, I told you you should have built it here. Yeah. <laughs> um, Grace Doris, she went on, uh, lived, I think, till into her eighties. Um, she she even after Wiley's death, she helped out in his in his law firm. So, one of the other story, one of the other stories I want to talk about, if I can find it here. Catching a Pyro. In the early afternoon of January 16, 1987, the Bakersfield Fire Department was dispatched to a fire inside the Craft Mart store on Ming Avenue. A quick thinking employee had already extinguished the flames with a fire extinguisher by the time the fire department arrived. The flames were contained to a display bin of dried flowers. Recognizing this fire as suspicious in nature, the fire department's incident commander requested an arson investigator. Um, it didn't take the investigator long to determine the cause, the, the cause of the fire. A, fi a, a delayed incinerary device composed of materials easy, easily purchased at any grocery, liquor, or convenience store. It was discovered at the bottom of the display bin of dried flowers. Whoever started the fire simply walked by and dropped the device in the bin. As the arson investigator was wrapping up his work at the scene of the Craft Mart on Ming, another fire broke out at the Hancock Fabric Store on South 8th Street and Wilson Road. The fires at Hancock Fabrics triggered the store's fire suppression sprinkler system. The fire was quickly doused. Two fires erupting within an hour of each other at two separate retail stores during business hours, only two miles apart. There were too many coincidences not to be connected to one fire setter. Bakersfield arson investigator and Bakersfield Fire Department Captain Marvin Casey was very busy on that January day in 1987. Two of his fire department colleagues were at the arson investigation conference in Fresno. And they called him when he was going over to the uh, Bitten Park fire and basically said, where are you guys? I'm busy down here. Can you get down here? And that he told them what kind of fires he had at, at two retail stores. And his colleagues said, that's interesting. There was a fire up here, two fires up here in Fresno, same type of retail stores. Um, the investigators at the fire Fresno conference revealed there had been two fires in Fresno, including at a Hancock fabric store. Authorities later learned there were more fires in Tulare, six fires in the span of only a couple of days, each fire starting in similar environments, retail stores, all in the Central Valley. The incinerator device Captain Casey discovered at the Craft Mart would later prove to be a crucial piece of evidence. Whoever the arsonist was, was left their fingerprint on it. Captain Casey had a hunch that the arsonist was probably an arson investigator attending the conference in Fresno. Now there's a there's a whole story between here and the ending. Um, he submitted some names for that, uh, for the, or submitted some names of people that he kind of suspected could have been the arsonist. They had to live south of Bakersfield. They had to be driving alone. So people that fit that type of profile, um, he got some a list of names. It was too large, um, so they couldn't narrow it down from that. But in the meantime, while they're trying to identify 
um, identify or, or run, get somebody to match these fingerprints, the arsonist was busy with other fires down in Southern California. Um, he was burning uh, other retail stores, uh, grocery stores, craft stores, stuff like that, and also uh, brush fires. And Marvin Casey finally matched that fingerprint up with an arson investigator at the Glendale Fire Department. And one of those fires in, down in LA was an Olay department store. And down in, in, I'm not sure where it was, but it was down in LA. It killed four people. And so now this arsonist had advanced from arson to murder. And eventually that fingerprint was matched with a suspect and it was an arson investigator. He actually was a guru of arson investigators. He was adored. And um, Marvin Casey kind of got a little pushback when he revealed who, you know, that it might be an arson, arson investigator. They're just like, no way. But if it wasn't for that little piece of evidence, that one fingerprint, this case probably wouldn't have ever been solved. Marvin Casey is here tonight. Stand up, Marvin. <laughs> he put away somebody responsible for four murders. I think that's pretty incredible. Um, Joseph Wambaugh covered that story and covered all of those fires um, in his book, Fire Lover. And Mr. Casey is in that book. I uh, got to meet Joseph Wambaugh. And uh, that was pretty remarkable that we have that caliber of, of, of people in Bakersfield. So. Did they have that uh, on ID? You know, they did. Yeah, you were interviewed for that, right, Marvin? On ID or it, for some kind of TV show. Yeah, yeah. It's been a few years ago. Oh, really? And you're interviewed for all of them? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, oh. That was pretty remarkable. Pretty remarkable that somebody in Bakersfield. How many fires was he responsible for altogether? Yeah. <laughs> His name was John Orr, was the arsonist. <laughs> they put yeah, there was a big uh what do they call it? Uh, uh task force to catch that that arsonist. And another thing that kind of did Orr in was that he was writing a book about an arson investigator who was setting fires. <laughs> It was kind of like an autobiography of <laughs> they wanted actually I guess the, the the they wanted to catch him in the act and like catch him stake out his house. Uh, they even put out a tracking device on his car on his vehicle and he discovered it. Um, and then he he uh, once they found out that he wrote a book, then they went and got the book, and it's like everything's right there. He wrote everything down, so it's pretty pretty remarkable. Once they had the book, then they went ahead and arrested him. They didn't have to catch him in the act anymore. So, um, anything else you want to add to that, Marvin? Or anybody have any any questions for Marvin? Thank you. <laughs> this is the first time we've met. I interviewed him on the phone when I when I did the story. So. So um, how many people are interested in learning about how to do research, uh, utilize the local history room on researching, or are you just here to see me? <laughs> huh? First one. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> The ars if you couldn't hear that, the arsonist, John Orr, is the one, was his instructor who got him certified in arson investigation. Right, right. Isn't that incredible? 
And you got a lot of pushback, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was in the office. The fireman would walk by me, and he'd say, he's innocent, you know. I said, well, it should end up on that piece of <laughs> now where was the uh craft mart store was it there kind of yeah 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 interesting um so, Lynn, <laughs> how are we going to do this? Oh, so everybody on my book, if um, I put I put one of these on your th on your seats, um, it's just a postcard. If you want to buy my book, um, you can. It has a QR code. Does there anybody know how to use a QR code with their phone? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Or you can go to NotoriousBakersville.com and um, click uh, the book, and it'll take you to the Amazon site. But you can also reach it with one of one of these. Ann? Before you get into the resources, you tell us a little bit how you got involved with starting the podcast. Sure. How you became a model. I just kind of. I just kind of assume. <laughs> I just kind of assume people know the backstory. So during COVID, I, uh, at the very beginning of COVID, when everybody was uh, uh, streaming their favorite shows on, on Netflix, I, um, I started researching old, or reading old newspaper articles from the Bakersfield Californian. Fascinating stories that, that I had never heard about. Stories, you know, 100 years ago. And I wanted to retell these stories uh, somehow. And I didn't know, didn't know what media I should use. I considered writing a blog. And then I'm not a very good writer. So I decided, you know, I'm going to do a podcast. And I have no experience in podcast or audio or radio. And so I was a quick study on podcasting. And um, I did my, released my first uh, episode in June 1st, uh, 2021. Um, and then it just grew after that. And I listen, I go back and I listen to that first episode and I cringe. But, um, so I said, I'm not a very good, get very good writer about a year into, um, I write the script for my podcast and then, you know, I talk, I talk about it so I can write a script, you know, how I'm going to talk, how I'm going to present the story. Um, but as far as a reader consuming it, I'm not very good. So about a year into my podcast, I um, received an email from somebody, a lady named Carolyn Harvey from Georgia, and she's originally from Bakersfield. And she said, hey, I really enjoy your podcast. I'm originally from Bakersfield, and Notorious Bakersfield is my connection to Bakersfield. And um, So then about six months later, she came out to Bakersfield, and she wanted to meet me. Um, is that Mike McCoy? Yeah, I'm Mike McCoy. Uh, she and her, she came out with her mom and uh, daughter, and they were going to go to the Kern County Museum. And they asked me if I wanted to go, and I said, uh, "It's August, no." <laughs> <laughs> no offense, Mike McCoy. <laughs> so we met at a Starbucks, and I found out that she was a writer and editor and multimedia expert and she does PR in her daytime job and so when I found that out I was like I wonder if she'd be interested in partnering with this uh, book and so that I approached her and she didn't hesitate and she said absolutely so she basically took my scripts and wordsmithed them into something that's readable and uh, uh, and we edited it all through all through uh, the summer this last summer so and we published it through Amazon.
That's kind of the genesis. Hi, Mike McCoy. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> all of that. What makes your antenna go up when there's all these unfortunate use of dye inversions? What I, I, I hate to say this, what I enjoy about those old, old stories is that the Bakersfield, Californian used to go out and knock on the neighbor's doors and find out, you know, all the, all the juicy details. If it was a love triangle that was the cause of this or, you know, they wrote about that, you know, that it was some kind of love triangle. And um, it was just so, it was just filled with so much detail. And law enforcement at the time, they used to like invite the reporters in, oh, look, here's the dead body, you know. And it, today they write their stories based on a press release. And they're like a 38 year old man, blah, 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 blah. And then sometimes they might print it in the paper a week later. Uh, who the victim was and who the suspects were. And uh, uh, that's how journalism is today. So I, I, I enjoy reading those old stories with all the details. Um, and you can kind of tell which story is kind of notorious by how long it was in the news. Uh, usually when, when the suspect goes to trial, it's gonna be in the news a lot. If there's nobody goes to trial, there's usually not too much follow-up, like if the suspect died or something like that. Um, the, the story that I released today, um, it was the 1993 uh, uh, Contre Diana Contreras murder from the Valley Plaza. That, it was in, this is the 30th anniversary this week. And the, the killers, they didn't go to trial until 95. So it was in, and they followed that story the whole time, you know, a year and a half that it took to go to trial. So not that it was especially a lot of details, but it was in the news constantly, constantly. Every hearing that they had, they publish it. And uh, so kind of, kind of like that. So whatever was a notorious story back in the day, um, like the two fires that, that Marvin was on, that wasn't too much of a story then when it, I think it might have gotten a newspaper, one article when it happened. I know there was a picture in the paper of a firefighter walking out of the uh, Hancock fabric store. Um, and then there was nothing after that until the arrests were made, you know, until they got a suspect arrested. So it wasn't too notorious until years later, you know. So um, yeah, that's what I look for. The modern, modern or recent, I should say, anything in the in a, in the internet age, I'm not too interested in. Like everybody asked me about Vincent Brothers, and I haven't closed the door on that. Um, but if you want to know whatever you want to know about Vincent Brothers, all you have to do is Google them, and there's you know a lot of information out there. So I like stories kind of before the internet. That's my that's my inner, you know, take on it. Anne. Since the start, we see that the library's resources, paper databases, are at the book, and that was yeah. familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? Yes. Where are you doing that from? Yeah, from my walk in closet. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody laughs at me, but that's. <laughs> yeah, my big studio. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, suggestions? I remember I first met you in here, you were researching oh a story about a Santa. The killer Santa. The killer Santa. Did you ever, you were looking mm -hmm. for information, was that solved? That no. Okay. No, it was Christmas time. Here's a Christmas story for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, does anybody remember the killer Santa? Okay, few people. Um, and there's some stuff I didn't put in the podcast, so um, you're, you're getting the director's, <laughs> the director's view. Uh, a man came up from Joshua Tree 
he was a dog breeder and he was selling a uh, German Shepherd. I think he had two German Shepherd puppies. And he was supposed to rendezvous, rendezvous here in Bakersfield with somebody that was buying these puppies. And they're gonna meet at a Denny's restaurant. And he stopped at the, and I learned this after I did the podcast. He stopped at the Denny's on uh, Panama. And he was sitting there, nobody showed up. So he called somebody else in Oakland that knew who this guy he was supposed to rendezvous with. Oh, and he was there with a friend too. And they said, oh, you're at the wrong Denny's. You're supposed to be at the one on White Lane. So he went to the Denny's on White Lane. And I didn't know that until after I did the podcast. Um, so he's sitting there and he got a call at the restaurant. Somebody, this is pre-cell phone days, 19, late 80s. And uh, the waitress said, you know, I can't, remember, can't even remember his name now. But anyways, said, is this your name? And he said, yeah. She goes, oh, you have a cell, you have a, a phone call. So he got up to answer the phone call. And it was kind of a weird phone call. Like it gave him a weird vibe. And so he went, got his friend. They walked out to their car. And a guy dressed as Santa Claus carrying a package, a long package, came around the corner and started shooting him and killed the, the dog breeder. His friend was wounded um, and taken to the, the hospital by ambulance, but the, the dog breeder was killed. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that he typically wore a bulletproof vest and was usually carrying a gun. He, his family claimed that he did that because of some of the characters that he sold dogs to. I don't know if I believe that, but when I was researching the story, I found his, his daughter's name and I called her to see if she would be interested in, you know, being interviewed. And she was really creeped out <laughs> that it's been 25, 30 years. And she goes, why are you bringing this up now? I'm like, well, I, you know, do this crazy podcast in Bakersfield and this is kind of a crazy story. And, and she just didn't want to participate at all because it's still an unsolved case. And I didn't mention any of that on the podcast. Um, she's still scared for her life and her mom's life. Her, both of them are still alive. So, um, and I can respect that. <clears throat> A uh, Bakersfield police officer, after he heard the story, um, he emailed me and he was the first one on the scene. And so I talked to him and he says, it's never gonna be solved. He said, they know who did it. They just don't have the evidence to prove it. So um, he thinks, this police officer thinks that it was some kind of drug deal or not drug deal. Somebody got burned in a drug deal and they think they used the, the dog breeding as a ruse to get him away from his operation in, in, uh, in Joshua Tree. It's kind of an interesting story. So, and since it's Christmas time, <laughs> Killer Santa. Oh, what was the headline? Oh, the headline in the Californian. I wish I had it. The headline, any Californian people here, Bakersfield, Californian? The headline was Ho, 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 Homicide. <laughs> <laughs> and every time I bring that up to uh, ask, because I was asking uh, reporters at the time, Michael Trihe, and uh, he, I think he covered it. Uh, he's with KGT now. But uh, I asked him about the killer Santa, and he goes, oh, ho, 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 homicide. <laughs> they had some great, great, uh, great writers back then, I guess. <laughs> Headline writers. So, the other interesting thing, another connection to the the uh, Bakersfield Californian, uh, and it, that's a story in the book uh, called "The Killer Columnist," and his name was Gene Harrington, and he started out. He was a, a prisoner in Tatchapi, and he wrote a letter to the editor, and he was such a good writer 
they invited him to write more. And he ended up, he was really prolific. He wrote multiple, multiple articles about life on the in, inside of Tatchby. He had a huge Bakersfield following. Um, matter of fact, they furloughed him during the fair. Uh, the Bakersfield Californian brought him out of Tatchby, and he went to the fair and went to the Bakersfield Californian's booth and met his fans, and they wined and dined him for a day. And then they sent him back to Tatchby. Well, he was uh, eventually paroled. And he was paroled, well, I think, I don't think it was any violent crimes. I think it was like robberies and stuff like that. Um, so he moved back to Bakersfield uh, because that's where all of his readers were, you know. And uh, he wrote more articles. It was, he wasn't as prolific as when he was in jail. He didn't, didn't have the time, you know. <laughs> he was going to school. I think he won a couple scholarships, and um, he, he oh he, he taught dancing, ballroom dancing, and he was really a ladies' man. And he dated this one lady named Mary, and they had a relationship for a while, and then that died off, fizzled out. But they remained friends. They were good friends, Mary and and uh, Jean, and. Mary lived in Oildale. I'm trying to remember the street because you're the Oildale expert, huh, Fred? <laughs> and um, she lived in this little duplex, and she had a uh, she had some kids, I think, and she was having a prowling a prowler would you know come to her house, and it kind of progressed in, from prowler to peeping tom. And it really creeped her out. She didn't feel safe there. Matter of fact, her mom stayed with her for a while. And uh, they, she and her mom went away. And the prowler came in and, and stole her underwear, her mom's underwear. And she goes, she's like a 60-year-old lady. What's he doing with her? So it was just kind of really creeped her out. Well, she was going to go to Disneyland. And she asked Gene Harrington if, uh, if he would watch her her house while they were while they were out of town and he said sure and so they go to Disneyland and they come home from Disneyland and her house is a bloody mess there's bullet holes blood all over her duplex and she's like what the and she calls Gene and he says you that prowling problem you have no more so she had no idea what to do. She's like, oh my goodness, you know. And the next day, I think, she read in the paper that they pulled a body from a canal and that was riddled with bullets. And so she called somebody in law enforcement, a friend of hers, and he advised her to get an attorney. <laughs> and uh, the attorney kind of represented her in the things, and, and they offered her full immunity to tell her story about what transpired. And he was, work by that time, Gene was working at the welfare department, and they arrested him at the welfare department for the murder. The victim's name was Don Massey, and I got an email from somebody after the story ran, and they said, Don, that's not Don. Don was not the prowler, the peeping Tom, or whatever you want to call it. They just claim that just was not Don's character. So I don't know. Um, I was really anxious to see the end of this and how all this, uh, anxious to read all the stories. And Gene ended up pleading guilty to manslaughter. So if you know anything, after that, once they plead, they get sentenced. There's no more story after that. It's done. And uh, I was really disappointed in that. <laughs> so I wanted to hear the details because it's just kind of odd that he would kill some. I think there's more to the story. I don't know what it is, but I think there's more to it. Uh, like 76, 77, somewhere around there. No. And I think he's, he moved up to the Bay Area and died. No. That's pretty. Any other? And that's in the book. The gene. It's called the killer columnist. <laughs> Speaking of writing headlines, 
So do you want to talk about the uh, resources? So let me tell you, years ago I used to look at old uh, newspapers here at the library. I think they used to be on the other side of the room, the microfilm. And we had to use one of these. And does everybody remember these? And you kind of like would look up crime or murder or um, this is a different card catalog. And then do you know how they did that, Ann? Was it like every day they went through the paper and indexed? And that, yeah. And you can still see that card catalog on right by the right by the uh, the elevators out there, and it's like two thing, card catalogs. But that's how we used to look up old newspaper articles, and we get the card, and and it would tell us what what year and what edition and all that, what publication. So they're a little more advanced now. <laughs> Technology has come full circle. Um, what are we going to do first? Uh, <coughs> is that the <laughs> kick it? Yeah. Well, let's do the newspaper index. Here. Oh, timed out. So this is basically the same thing as the card catalog. Oh, I can't go all the way over there. Um, Bakersfield News. You can search by the newspaper, title, subject, author, um, and then the abstract is kind of details. Or, but let's go with newspaper. So let's say um, who should we? Well, I'm trying to think of uh, an old story. Uh, Kip Curry. Who? Kip Curry, the murder of Kip Curry. Where was that? Uh, down at the tender line about 1930. Or an old story. I just found a new story. <laughs> C U R R Y? I think it's Kip. Kip Curry. Oh, 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 oh. C U R Y R Y. Backspace, uh, two R's. Let's just do well, okay. It's hard when I can't see it. Right? Okay. Still nothing. Uh, I'm a Yeah. So, I, this is one of the stories in the book. Odd Cornell, he killed his wife and stepdaughter in 1926. Um, he lived until, well, he was one of the oldest uh, prisoners in San Quentin. So, basically, this did the same thing that the card catalog did. You just type in the name. And it'll come up with whatever, um, whatever is on microfilm, and um, there should be more than this, but I don't know why. And then you can just, if you want, like if you're sitting at home and you want to keep a copy of it, you can email yourself the this particular one, put your email in it, and send yourself the email. And then when you come to the library, you can tell Lynn, oh, I want to look up this article and you have all the information 
everything that's right here is basically. Um, but if it's in the Bakersfield Californian prior to 1977 and also dates up to 2018, we can search in the newspaper archive database because the Californian is available digitally in that database online. So this is dated 1977. So you could search in the newspaper archive database for this article. Mm -hmm. If it's after 1977, when you go into the newspaper archive database, you can actually click on the title list and you can see which titles are available and the dates that are digitized in the database. And if you see that it is not digitized, then you would come into the library and we would pull the microfilm. I can't see my cursor. Um, so the... So this is the newspaper archives that she was talking about. And um, is that what you click on? Mm -hmm. You will need your library card with your number on the back, and you can get in there for free. You don't have to pay whatever it is that they charge. With your library card, it's free. There's one, one stipulation. It's only good for California. So if you're looking for something, newspapers out of California, um, you'll have to have a paid subscription for it. But um, basically that's... So the publication list is here. And you can search here if you type in Bakersfield, California, for Bakersfield, California. Popping up. Yep. And then you can just basically search. This is a much easier way to do it because it's kind of AI generated. It picks up whatever you're searching for, like Kid Curry or what, you know, it's, it's a much better way to search, much more efficient. So you can see the red bars identify which papers are digitized. If you hit that arrow there, it would go and so by year. And when you click, if you were to, yeah, you have to do tab. Oh. Oops. So <laughs> when you um, click on, for example, if I were to click on this year, 1892, the red dots indicate what is digitized, and no red dot indicates what's not digitized. So that would help you identify if you want to come in and use and I've asked and I've asked, like, why is there February 29th right. and nothing for, you know, it's just crazy. It and makes no long, sense. Robbins? Yeah, the... the <laughs> allows you to search. This shows you what's indexed. Baker Silk papers that are digitized in this database and that are searched. And they're all, what are they? Yeah, they're all, they all morphed into the Bakersfield California. Uh, the Bakersfield Morning Echo it was independent, and then the Californian bought them out. I heard for like eight hundred thousand dollars back in like the nineteen twenties, which that was a it seems like a lot of money to me for back then. But and they were, they they published the Bakersfield Echo for like three weeks, and then shut it down. They took care of their competition. <laughs> so I usually just leave it on search all. You can limit by date, plus or minus exact date or between, and then. Uh, with all of the words or exact phrase, and you can find obituaries by typing in the person's name here, and then the date is helpful to have you narrow down. Um, we also have the Genealogical Society next door. They're very helpful if you're looking for information about family histories or people in the family. 
and they have an obituary uh, index. index. On their website. So if you go to their website, there's an obituary index, and it will tell you if there's a death notice or an obituary, because early 1980s, they uh, stopped publishing obituaries for free. So if the family didn't pay for it and write it and submit it, there's no obit. Um, so they were free prior to that. And uh, also death notices, if the funeral home did not submit the death notice, no death notice was published in the paper. What's your website like? Um, Kern County Genealogical Society dot com, or I think just Google Kern Geological. K C G H S dot com. Now about this um, newspaper archives. It just recently changed. It used to be they didn't have anything after 1977. And I just accidentally discovered it, that it now goes to 2018. So I'm ecstatic now. I can research stories from the 80s and 90s, and that's kind of fun. So, so the results of what the articles look like and to No, it's no. free through the library. All of the online resources is freely available. Um, you do have to log in using your library card. Your library card is also free. You need your library card number. You go to the library's website first. Once you basically walk through, <coughs> they go to our homepage, which is uh, the Kern County Library homepage. It says get a library card. You click on the get a library card link, and there are instructions on how to get the library card. You don't have to write the app. Um, you click on the online resources from the home page. I just thought we navigated that. Yeah, but you didn't see that. That's right. They didn't see. They didn't know. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, we might have had it bookmarked. Um, but I did want to mention that when you're searching in this database, it actually highlights the words that you've used to search. And when you click on the result, you are able to snip and clip the articles and email them to yourself and also print. So if you have a printer at home, and it will add all of the citation information to the record. So you don't have to add that. It'll say Bakersfield, California, and it will tell you the page number that it's on, the section, and the date that it was published. And it highlights all your search words. And it highlights your search terms. So all of the tools are here. And if anybody wants help with this, you can call the local history room. I'll walk you through it. Or come in. I'll show you how to use the database. I'm happy to help you navigate. It's really fun and easy to use. And if you set up an account, I highly recommend setting up a free account and doing that in all of our databases. You can put things in file folders and they'll be, they'll be there for you when you go back and log back in. Rob, you also use our city directory from your books. Yeah. Physical resources? Um, these books back here, these are all high school yearbooks. I think they have all of the, are all of the high schools represented here? We're donated. Some of our donations, but we have. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we're always looking for donations. Of, of yearbooks? I didn't know that. I just sold a bunch of them. <laughs> um, and then the uh, city directories. Let's say you lived in Bakersfield in, when did you come, Marvin, 1962? 64. And you're kind of curious about where your family, if your family made it to the city directory. Um, just look up, probably 65, because it took a while to get in there. Look up your family's name, and uh, it would tell a lot of information here, you know, the head of households, uh, occupation, um, where they work sometimes, how many, how many people they had, kind of like a, a census, and they're real nosy back then. So it's pretty, pretty fascinating. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we talked about that uh, at, at the book launch, yeah. And, and that's what's kind of fun, too, with the city directories is look at the old advertisements, and they have pictures of, of the old businesses and stuff like that. But, yeah, she was saying that a lot. they put a lot of information in the paper years ago, uh, like they put the, na the jurors' names, their addresses. And uh, Mike Hart was at my... Um, book launch party Sunday. Uh, he was a, or John Hart. Uh, 
he was a um, he was a photographer for the Bakersfield Californian for years and years and years. Now he teaches at BC and Cal State. Um, but we were talking about the Tyak murders, and when they went to the um, when they went to the scene of the crime, John Hart went with them and he took pictures of the jurors while they were viewing the scene of the crime. You wouldn't have that happen today. Uh, matter of fact, uh, uh, gosh, who, Joe Solis, he murdered his business partner. And when the jury went out for lunch, they pick, took a picture of him crossing the street. You know, that wouldn't, that wouldn't happen today. No. Pretty, pretty incredible what they, what they put in there. And that became a problem because in obituaries, they'd put the address of the, you know, the decedent. And then during the funeral, people go <laughs> rob their house. <laughs> yeah. They stopped doing that when that became a problem. So, yeah, here family is in mourning, and then they have to, they're victims of a burglary. So. Um, and yeah, and those are all back here. Um, they're pretty, pretty fascinating. So they go back, what does the city directory go back to? Uh, early 1900s. Oh, wow. City of Bakersfield, and then we also have the Haynes directory. So, and then I also have more phone books and directories. And we have a vault with photographs and first editions. I have a, an inventory for the vault um, index. And we also just inventoried all of the newsletters that we have here. And uh, we are archiving newspapers, local city newspapers. And I, I'm going to donate the manuscript to the Notorious Bakersfield uh, book, um, but I forgot it. <laughs> I, I, I was halfway here and I'm like, oh, crap. Yeah, no, it's just it's just a binder, a binder. So, does anybody have any questions about researching? I know it's probably you're probably swimming and oh my god, <laughs> you're gonna go home, put your library card in, and start searching your name, right? <laughs> um, do you have anything you want to add? Because oh, I, I think. To add that I, I work closely with the Kern County Museum. Mike McCoy is here. Um, I refer people there quite a bit. The Bakersfield Californian kept their photographs in their own archive, but we are the archive for the news articles. So people contact me, contact me looking for photographs that were published in the Bakersfield Californian, and I typically contact Christine Peterson over there, and they donated their photographic collection to the Kern County Museum. So. I also refer people to the CSUB Historical Research Center. Chris Livingston's in charge over there. He used to be here, so he has a very intimate knowledge of the collection. Um, they also have microfilm there, so in the odd or off chance that our machine has not been working, which has really only happened one time that I've been in here, I was able to refer people over to CSUB. And then, of course, I work closely with the Genealogical Society. And also, I'd like to mention that there's quite a few museums, railroad museums and oil museums in that have a lot of information as well. But again, we'd love your yearbook. So I had a yearbook party here, and I think you know the two, ten people that showed up, we didn't have their yearbooks, and I was like, "Here's one from 1936. If you want to, isn't this interesting?" And yeah, I still want to see my yearbook, <laughs> my picture in it. So they are by donation, <laughs> and um, it's pretty pretty comprehensive up to the 1980s without any swipes. So. We are going to do a book giveaway, yeah. so Robert's going to pick um, a ticket out of the cup, which I think is somewhere. Oh, let me tell you a funny story about the yearbooks. I did. I covered, does anybody know who uh, Cheyenne Cadena was? He was a, a Mexican mafia lieutenant. Um, he was arrested when he was 14 years old over by, he killed... He killed somebody over at uh, Salon Juarez over on East Truxton. And he was only 14. He went to East High. He went to prison when he was in prison. He went to prison as a kid. He was 14, okay? Um, he rose through the ranks of the Mexican Mafia. He operated outside of the, Mex outside of the prison walls. He was, like, he was like really entrenched. A lot of people think he, he started the Mexican Mafia. He didn't start it, but he rose through the ranks. Um, he ended up being assassinated in prison, and he's still revered to this day. Um, American Me is based on his life, but if you watch it, there's nothing that says anything about Bakersfield. Uh, Edward James almost played the character that's supposed to be based on. 
So anyways, I came to the Bill Memorial Library to look at their, new, their, their uh, yearbook collection and go through East High, found, figured out the year that he would have been there. Oh, and they, they have on the back of the yearbook what pages. So I go to that page that he's, this shows you how revered he is, went to the page that, that Rudolph Cadena was supposed to be on and somebody had stolen the picture. <laughs> and then I visited his grave in, in Union Cemetery. He's been dead since the 70s. People are still, they're taking beer out there, sitting on his grave, sitting on his headstone, taking flowers. He's been dead for years, so he's still revered. <laughs> okay, ready? What's your next story going to be about? What are you working on now? Oh, uh, Honky Tonk Murder. <laughs> um, it was happened over on Edison Highway. It was an old um, Honky Tonk. I'm trying to think of the name of it. What year? I don't know. I didn't write the story. Carolyn wrote it, so uh -huh. <laughs> I just read it. But anyway, it's an interesting story, yeah. Next, next Tuesday, and then I'm going to do a story about the watermelon boy uh, for Christmas because I didn't want to do a downer story for Christmas. Well, it's kind of a downer. He dies. The little watermelon boy dies. He got a craving for watermelon, and Bakersfield citizens went to bat for this poor dying boy. Um, his name was Layshot. Layshot? Donald Layshot. He's like 13 years old. And he just wanted a piece of watermelon. He's dying. And it's not in season in, in the United States. So somebody knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody with United Airlines. And they got this kid a watermelon and flew it into Bakersfield. He got to eat his watermelon. And then two days later, he died. What, yeah, I know. It's really sad. But, but it just shows Bakersfield citizens, you know, responding to this poor dying kid's wish. So he got his watermelon. <laughs> uh, and there's still lay shots around today. The there's no crime. That's what, <laughs> see, that's the thing. It's not all crime. Yeah. And I didn't want to do too, too, too much of a downer story. So and I did a story on streaking in Bakersfield, too. <laughs> uh, do we need, how about 338? 338. Really? Fred? Oh, Austin. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, do you want me to autograph it? Thank you, Robert. Thank you for having me. I appreciate everybody coming. <laughs>